Hello everyone and welcome to Autism Stories. I'm your host Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people and others in the autism community to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their advice. If you'd like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. There are some sound issues, especially in the first few minutes of my conversation today, um, so I really apologize about that. Today, we're going to be joined by Marcus Boyd, who is a seven-time Grammy Award-nominated producer who joins us today to talk about his career in autism acceptance and advocacy. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Marcus, thanks so much for joining Autism Stories today. Thank you for having me. I'm a huge platform in the program, and I'm beyond honored. I wanted to start out with, uh, where does your story in the autism community begin? I was born with autism. Um, January 31st, 1983. I didn't get uh, professionally diagnosed until April 12th, 1983. I was 10 years old. Health Center in Virginia, Georgia. Dr. Keith was my doctor. Erna Looper was my therapist. Dr. Carr was my social worker. Bob Portner was my behavior aide. Annie Gibbs was my speech therapist. Okay, I can keep going. Okay, <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> I, can, I can do this all day long because you know back then everybody had a title. Everybody signed was separate. Was it like the social worker was the therapist? Everybody had a title. So my story begins there. I was in foster. I got in foster care in '87. Um, because my biological father broke my ribs in two places. And um, because I had emotional behaviors, drooling on myself, using a bathroom on myself, not being able to verbalize um, what I wanted or needed and stuff of that nature. And when he tried to take me to the park, I couldn't catch a football, couldn't catch a basketball. That was that important. And I was not like the other guy's sons. So that made me very upset, very, very, very abusive, physically, emotionally, mentally. So I was driven to my mom's best friend at the time, and it was Dr. Carr. She was an intern for the Cab County um, defects, the Cab, you know, Cab County Children's Services, and stuff of that nature. So she took me to her home. This was before the hip law even existed. So I was like four or five years old. And, you know, I ended up, long story short, I ended up being in foster care. She ended up being my social worker, not just my godmother. And so I was with her cases. And we talked about 16, 17 in foster homes, 16, 17 in homes, 16 mental institutions. I mean, you talked about electrical shock therapy, sports, physical. I took the red lid packs and Depakote, been being upset with Queen Solo, Depakote, 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day, two to three pills a day. Now, you've come a long way since then. You're you're currently the CEO of Marcus Boyd Beats and create music in uh, something I read in about 18 different genres. So, yes, I do. I do make 18 different genres. I play instruments. I'm the CEO of Marcus Boyd Beats. Miss D Entertainment, I'm the CEO of that. It's a gospel entertainment company out here in Tucson, Arizona. I am a celebrity interviewer. I am a clothing line owner uh, of the A Collection clothing line. And I am a, a four-time award-winning autism activist. And I am a 13-time music award-winning music producer composer. And I've been nominated for a Grammy seven times. What? What made you um, want to like branch out and create music in so many different genres? You know, again, if I could be transparent, growing up in the hood and the projects in Brooklyn, New York, in Atlanta, Georgia, and stuff of that nature, we like and back in those days, we, we was not given a lot of opportunities. The Boys and Girls Club and the Community Center; those were, those were the only two things you really had. Or if you was a sports jockey, you was in the 
sports and stuff of that nature. I, I couldn't run up that. So, you know what I'm saying? That, that killed sports for me. So, my grandma had a uh, thing at church. It was a band camp. You get to go to band camp for free for two months, for 60 days. She snatched me and a bunch of my brothers, <laughs> and we went to band camp. <laughs> So I had a trombone. I think my other brother had a violin. My other brother had a trumpet and stuff. We were trying to be like a musical Jackson Five. And so you mentioned being a um, someone that's interviewed celebrities. Um, mm-hmm. What what do you think? You know, I, I interview people um, once a week here on Autism Stories. What what have you learned from interviewing um, all these different celebrities? Sometimes the attitudes can stink. <laughs> Sometimes they can be good. You know, it's, it's, it's no different from your platform. Some people's attitudes are amazing, and some people's attitudes are like, oh my God, why did I even want to do this interview? But I'm, just being, I'm just being real. Now, you are, you're a rapper and producer, and I learned about you from a great um, autism PSA you created. You start off the PSA about rapping about how nobody understands what it's like to... Uh, be nobody all- understands being autistic, being a, nobody understands having autism and being a rapper, but they use a lyrical metaphor to reduce, to reduce my self esteem. Right. So, what what do you wish the hip hop culture would understand about about you or the lives of other autistics? Okay, let's take me out of it. Okay, let's take me out of, it, uh, of the equation. What I want the world to understand about other. Autism individuals is stop looking at the diagnosis and look at their gifts and their talents. Start stop looking at what you feel they can't do and start looking at things they are doing right in front of your face. We are intelligent, we are brilliant, we are geniuses, we are gifted individuals in the autism communities. Stop looking for us to have a handicap when we're not giving you a handicap. You rap in the uh, PSA about how you use lyrical metaphors to in- induce your self-esteem. Ha- mm-hmm. How do you see rap as something that's had a positive effect on you? I mean, you know, the wordplay, because I'm, I'm big on words. So, you know, I I, I, I study rhyming dictionary, the sources, dictionaries, and stuff of that nature to be able to understand what the words are because it helps me vocabulary and it helps my lyrical definition to be able to express stuff that I couldn't express when I was a child. How often are you going through dictionaries? I mean right now I, I mean I am working on my new mixtape. It's called Sunday School Sunday School Freestyles Mixtape Volume One. Uh, so that's why I like ten songs on that because I'm a gospel rapper. So I choose to I choose to elevate Jesus instead of material already or materialistic situations. And I choose to talk about real life situations that I went through and how I struggled with my faith because I didn't start talking until I was 13, 13 and a half at a two year old's level. See, people not understanding this. When I I still have autism and I'm almost 40, but I had, they called it back then classic autism. That's what they called it. Five or six of the doctors said that I was brain dead or because my left side of my brain doesn't function correctly. I would never. Get an education. I will, somebody would feed me, clothe me, bathe me, because I have severe autism. But I've been on my own since I was seventeen. I've been bathing myself all my life. I've been clothing myself all my life. Now you also wrapped in the uh, PSA about spreading autism awareness for more than a month. What do you, what do you what do you see as things people can do to spread that awareness and acceptance? I think that it needs to be more programs, more events, more things that people can come out to and enjoy. And they can learn more about autism, not just in April. They can learn about it in May, June, July, (laughs) August, September. They can come to these functions and come to these events, come to these networking events, meet other families that have autism, come together for a common cause. Because this is more than just a cause, this is a lifestyle. Now, another thing in the PSA that you mentioned that for 13 years you were wordless. What, yes. What, what are some things people shouldn't do when, 
when interacting with someone who may be nonverbal or maybe just being in a state where it may be really hard to communicate at that moment? I think that we have to stop looking at vocabulary as the main source of communication. We have to learn. If you have a person with autism, you need to learn their communication. Learn the way they speak. Stop looking at words as the way they can only speak. There's writing, there's sign language, there's 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 other things, there's other ways for um your child, your teenager, your adult to speak to you. Where they if they make it a loud noise, they are trying to tell you what's going on. They are trying to speak to you. But we as people have to find within ourselves to get out of ourselves so we can be able to understand and learn their communication. And, and it's really interesting because the majority of communication from humans is not words that we speak anyway. It's nonverbal. You know, you've worked with many famous musicians, and I'm, I'm wondering whether um, famous or not, uh, working with them, did you disclose did you disclose that you're autistic? And if so, how has that been helpful to you in those collaborations? Okay, so up until 2011, 2012, I did not disclose that I had autism because simply I wanted to be normal, not knowing that I was already normal. In 2018, when I had a chance um, to work with Young Dolph and PRE in the studio in Atlanta, I did tell him and Key Glock, that I had autism. And it was it was a brush of a shoulder type thing. It was like, man, you got autism, these beats are fire. That's the, that's the only thing that dog said. That's the only thing he said. And it went to his other stuff. I mean, nobody looks at me different. Nobody treats me different. And I'm I'm still able to live a life, but in this life, I'm able to try to help somebody else out in the same community I come from. Because I am autistic. And how can people learn more about you and connect with you maybe after this interview? Um, well, I do got a new documentary yet. That's out. It's called My First Words Music, directed by Rafia Muhammad. She did her thing. It's a, it's a 20, 20 minute piece that tells a little bit more about my life story and my journey with autism. You can find that on all social media sites and everywhere out currently. If people want to connect with me, they can do that on Facebook, Marcus Leonardo Boyd, Instagram, Autism Activist Marcus Boyd, Twitter, at Boyd Autism. So, and my website, AutismActivistMarcusBoyd.com. Think, thinking about the future, what goals do you have in terms of your music and autism advocacy? Um, we we got a we got a digital we got, we going digital. So my clothing line, the hate collection, is a casual slash urban fashion wear for men, women, and children. The foundation of it comes from the autism community. So we believe that we showing our gifts through style. Um, so we have the autism music fest coming next year. We have my book coming. We have the docu series that's called Autism: The American Family Story where actual families get to tell their real-life stories and their trials and tribulations on film. Uh, we have my film company, Autism Art Films, where we're going to be telling the real-life stories of successful people with autism. You, you mentioned telling stories, and I think that's so important. Where do you th feel like we're at, it, you know, closing in at the end of 2020 in terms of telling stories about autistic folks? I think we have we, we dropped the ball because we so focus on COVID nineteen, we so focus on racial situations that it's been overshadowed with the stories that need to be told with the autism communities. So it's it's up to me and other people like me to help pick up the ball and help pick up the mantle and run with it. So these voices that's not heard and, and these stories that's not told can be heard and told. Well, Marcus, I really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks so much for uh, sharing your time with, with me today and uh, for the conversation. Yes, sir. I'm so honored. Thank you so much, Mr. Doug, for having me on your platform and stuff of that nature. And I will close with this. If you have autism, if you know anybody with autism, 
go ahead and love on somebody with autism and form an autism community. You can do anything you put your heart, your mind, and your faith to. Don't let your situation become your destiny. Move towards your future and your greatness because you're great, you're an icon, and you're a legend. And autism activist Marcus Boyd loves you and here for you. Thanks to everyone for listening, and thanks so much to Marcus for the conversation. To learn more about Marcus, his music, and advocacy, check out the link in the podcast description of this episode. You can also find a link for a free call to discuss how coaching from Autism Personal Coach can benefit you. So book a call with me today. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. On next week's episode of Autism Stories, Thomas Maloney joins us to talk about being a disabled senior leadership level employee. Talk to you then.